I don't think Church Universal and Triumphant is that different from uh, really mainstream religion now that they don't have a messenger. Um, and so the only threat that I would say that they pose would be the same threat any religion poses, which is that people who follow scripture or uh, a spiritual leader are not thinking for themselves. Well, um, I think those people should ask themselves and really look deeply into themselves um, to find out how well they know themselves. Because, again, nobody is immune. Everybody has to follow the same rules. And everybody has to follow, you know, our, our life is on a, on a timetable. We only have so much time. And if you spend a substantial portion of your life um, suppressing your desires and uh, following scripture that you haven't really examined, then you're going to come to a point in your life where you're going to regret it. And you're going to have to go back and pick up all those dropped stitches. And so they may not be hurting anyone, but they're probably hurting themselves. Well, I was really shocked because, you know, she was this infallible figure and this, this, uh, she was this person who could do no wrong and who had all the answers my whole life. And even after having left, I mean, this was several years after I left, and still, you know, it was shocking because I didn't know that she would ever admit any of that. Um, so it was really a, it was a, it was a really shocking and towering admission um, to me. And it, you know, there was, there was compassion, there was also a little anger. Well, because, you know, we'd all, and many people had based their lives and made decisions, gotten married, had kids, you know, changed jobs, changed schools, um, immigrated, emigrated, done any one of a number of things based on her recommendation. And, you know, that admission to me says that, you know, she was actually, mm, you know, more or less making this stuff up as she went along. And, you know, whatever was convenient for her. Like, if she needed somebody's skills, then um, she would say it was a good idea for them to come to the ranch. Uh, if she didn't need someone's skills, then she would tell them, go back to school. Um, and that kind of thing. You know, so she, it was, I think it was very self-serving. And when, you know, a part of me always knew that, but then um, to actually hear her admit it was something else again. Well, yes, I mean, I forgive her. I, I've moved on with my life, and I think that, you know, she, I mean, I think that um, I got a lot of gifts out of being at the church. I wish I could have the time back, but you know, I don't. Um, I don't hold that against her. I mean, a lot of a lot of people have uh, difficulties with their parents. I I see the whole thing in more philosophical terms, and I, I I'm more concerned about the the overall issue of people believing what she taught, and you know, having this body of work go forward, and people be reading it, you know, many hundreds or thousands of years from now. Um, like all religions, it seems like that's the main concern because I saw how this thing got started. I was there and I saw a lot of this stuff being kind of made up. So um, to think about people, you know, centuries from now looking at it like it's some sort of scripture, it's, it scares me. Well, because it's made up. I think, I think knowledge is an important thing. Uh, I'm very much of a scientist. I think we should stick to what we know, stick to what we can prove, and things that are made up should not be um, perpetuated, you know, except as fiction and entertainment. Well, yeah, and you know, it's, to get, it's to get to the heart of the question that we were originally talking about is you know, that when you, when you set up uh, communication with God or purported communication with God, then you know all bets are off, and so uh, I want to I want to get to the heart of why because it's it wasn't it's not just her giving these messages, it's also the people who are following it. And what I really want to understand is what was going through their minds when this was all going on. What how did they justify what was happening, and how did they continue to? You know, feel that for their own in, in for their own in their own lives that this was something of value and meaningful for them that they could follow. Um, I don't know if I'm really articulating that so well, but 
I'm, I'm, I really, a part of me, I mean, I know what happened, but another part of me, I don't know what was going on in people's minds who were followers. And that's, um, hindsight is 2020, and it's 20 years later, and I think it's a good opportunity to go back and pick up on, pick up on some of those thoughts. A lot of the, because um, I was in the engineering department, and so the engineers had a lot of questions. Uh, how much earth movement are we going to be expecting? Um, how much uh, blast pressure are we going to be expecting? How long are we going to have to stay underground? Uh, how much food are we going to need? How much fuel should we store? All those things, and those things were all uh, questions that were written down and given to my mom to, you know, to take to the altar, so to speak, and ask ask El Moria or ask God about what we should do. So there was a lot of a lot of that. We we looked for divine guidance for engineering, you know, what, what would have otherwise been engineering decisions. Well, yeah, I mean, because that was our whole uh, design criteria. I mean, these, the shelters started out to be uh, what would be called expedient shelters, meaning that you would only stay in them for a period of two weeks until the fallout had dissipated. And gradually the project grew to the point where we were thinking about a seven-month and seven-year underground scenario. I think everybody who was in the inner circle was really on board and there was a core team of, of people who were sort of in the project management and you know those people were absolutely solid. Um, there were people who you know who left at various times. I mean I think there were pre probably people who left in the middle of the night. I don't know. I mean there were hundreds of people working on the project. So I, I didn't have direct awareness of all that but I do know that at one time or another I think there were people who just said okay this is too weird I'm out. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I definitely was, and um, I remember saying to myself at a certain point, actually, that, you know, if, if this war doesn't happen, the church is screwed because of the amount of money that we were spending. Um, <clears throat> I think the shelters cost about $25 million in uh, 1989, so maybe that's more like $40 million now, something like that. All the money the church had came from a combination of donations and also uh, land sales because we had just sold a property in the um, Santa Monica Mountains in Los Angeles here, pretty close to where I am right now actually. And uh, that property sold for I believe 16 million. So that was some of the money and then you know there was um, contributions, book sales, um, conferences, various ways the organization brought in money. but. I think it was an all-out effort to, to come up with that kind of cash. And I don't think in the beginning that we even realized how much it was going to cost because the project grew. And that money originally was meant for the building of the above-ground community. You know, there had been a plan to put in kind of a, a pretty nice interim site. Uh, at the, it was called the Spring Creek site. Uh, it was the bottom of Devil's Slide. And that was put on hold because of the uh, EIS and the environmental uh, challenges that happened. So um, that would have been an improved situation. And so that wasn't exactly the church's fault. But, you know, I think maybe you could say that it was the church's fault because we didn't do our homework to find out what uh, was involved in the EIS process. So we just by planning to move 700 people up, you know, right next to Yellowstone Park, it was probably kind of naive. The EIS was released and then there was a challenge to the EIS uh, which was o overturned and um, permits were never issued because right at that point the shelter scandal broke. It was kind of all at the same time and I, I remember I mean it was the front page of the Billings Gazette and all the other papers there you know showed uh, aerial footage of the shelter construction and that was within days of the time when um, you know of the firearms arrest 